Hey, my name's Adam from Toronto, Ontario, and I subscribe to the Creative Control Patreon because I feel that uh, at the end of the day, uh, there are very few people in the industry who are able to consistently get the kind of quality interviews out of very diverse subjects of many creative stripes and disciplines, as Vish does pretty well on every episode of the podcast. It's a no-brainer to me that I want to support this when you factor that in to uh, all of the bonus content you get on Patreon, and, you know, it's a listener-supported podcast, so uh, I want to keep the uh, great content coming. So that's why you should also support Creative Control on Patreon. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash Control today. Andre Etier is a talented visual artist, songwriter, singer, and musician who hails from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. A founding member of the dearly departed garage rock band The Deadly Snakes, Etier has made some wonderful records of his own over the past 15 years, including his latest, Croak in the Weeds, which was released by Telephone Explosion Records on October 11th, 2019. Andre invited me to his home in Toronto recently to have a discussion about his life and times, his feelings about Toronto, the history of the Deadly Snakes, the fascinating themes of Croak in the Weeds, the state of his planned album trilogy, and much more. A part of the E1 Podcast Network with the support of listeners like you who subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash Control. Plus in-kind support from CFRU 93.3 FM, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton. This is the 503rd episode of Creative Control, featuring the artistic threat known as Andre Etche, with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Up and blinking in the afternoon, sunshine as he'll do. Till he's gone Turn over the lily pad Feeling so shy Kick up the mud He tries to hide Hi, Andre. How's it going? Pretty good. 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 It's nice to be in your home. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome I, to my home. It's a lovely... To my kitchen. <laughs> could do a kitchen show. That's... We could. I, we've done that before, sort of. You were on my one of my shows where we ate together. Yep. Back in the day, and uh, that was fun. This is great. This is a, a lovely home. What area of Toronto is this, technically? Little Portugal. Little Portugal. Okay. I would say. Yeah. And you've been here, what were you saying, 11 years? 11 years. So is it nice being in Toronto? For 11 years in the same house? A very that is, question. yes. <laughs> yes, it is nice to be in the same house for 11 years in Toronto. I mean, you didn't have to toil with all the shenanigans around real estate. I feel like you got in just ahead of when things really went it, bonkers. Uh, we got in right before things became impossible. But yes. it, it was still pretty crazy at that time, too. Competitive, all that stuff. The, the yes, day. competitive. And the prices seem to be going up monthly or I don't know it's crazy it's so wild I don't like it no one likes it I don't think anyone likes it but I think it's really crazy Toronto is going really crazy I think of you as a Toronto person are you from Toronto yep born and raised born and raised around Bathurst and Bloor kind of that the east annex okay okay so you don't west west annex I mean sorry west annex yes that's correct so have you ever pondered living somewhere else seriously I lived in Montreal for a couple of years for school for oh, okay. a few years for school but lived there of course i didn't oh. commute but no i think yeah we that's kind of the the fate of a torontonian or a lot of people from toronto is that you're bound to the city or you feel bound to the city but you, it's a you feel bound to the city i do I've, well i feel connected to the city and there's a lot about the city that i love but there's a lot about the city that i 
I don't like. I think that's a real Torontonian <laughs> attitude. Is you shouldn't, you can't love this city fully. It's a kind of a terrible city. Uh, I mean, I have a sense of what you love about it, given your history. But if you could voice some concerns, some things you wish. Well, well maybe to stay positive, like that. There is a lot to love. About Absolutely, this. but it's all community, and it's what you build around yourself and who you know, the people you know, and the streets that you're familiar with, and the story that you develop yourself in the city, almost in opposition to the powers that run the city that are actively trying to grind what is nice about the city out of the city or hmm. force it out of the city. So you have infrastructural concerns, so to speak, administrative concerns. Yeah, and I feel like that's always been Toronto's way. Toronto's like a is used like a like a resource, like as if it's a natural. Like it's to people are kind of trying to squeeze as much out of Toronto as it as they can. Developers, and yeah, but business type people, <laughs> business minded people, it government. Just, it, it's always been used as a place that you can go generate a bunch of money, leave a you know, scorched earth and then and, and behind you and then you, you go on somewhere else. I mean, it seems to be getting more and more crowded as a citizen of the city. Do you is there something that can be done about that kind of thing? I mean just trying to get around now is Yeah. You saw me, I couldn't get a parking spot. Yeah, Normally on yeah. there was no yeah. in this street I could get a parking spot no problem, but for some reason today yeah. I couldn't. And that's yeah. getting more and more common as I come in here. It's getting more crowded. I kinda like that though. You like that it's busy. Yeah, that's what I like. I like that there are more and more people moving into the city. I like that it's crowded. I've always liked crowded cities Hmm. and being in crowds. And I like tall buildings. I I think maybe there's a bit too much development, but I really like tall buildings and I like big cities. Okay, you're a city guy. Yeah, and I think everyone is welcome. I think there's a lot of room, but I think that the then government should rise to meet the incoming people with good government that supports them and you know what i'm saying yeah. i think you're saying on a lifestyle level yes on a on a kind of personal health level you'd like to see more intervention on that level i mean the development you're talking about some of it is for the people you just welcome. yeah it's true but it's but then but it's not is it like i mean well, uh, some who are they selling it. yeah too and they're not i would love to see great development and that was affordable yeah and was made with the intention of being affordable you're as as much as i mean we're here to ostensibly to talk about your music but you are a visual artist as well right yeah is toronto a a, a nice looking city compared to others you've been to no i don't think so it's a really (laughs) i think it's a really ugly city and i think as a painter i sometimes will think about other painters in history and how they would paint locally like paint their surroundings yeah and they're regional painters and they have a a a role in history as being the memory of of a city and at a time and i can't bring myself to paint this city i don't want to paint what i'm seeing when i see (laughs) yeah like i don't know what you would obviously there are some visual icons for toronto i mean primarily we have a giant tower yeah Uh, or you do i should say i I always say we We, when i talk to i i feel like i'm kind of part of the city i've come here all the time i've been working here for many years in some ways anyway enough about me (laughs) i don't know what you would direct someone to who is visiting as a to to find beauty in yeah a visual landmark that would be like that's a cool thing to go and hang out like a four like you know sometimes people will tell you to go to like the park and you toronto has some parks it does do you like any of the parks well, I like them. I think, well, I, High Park is beautiful. <laughs> it's a good, yeah, I'm not going to, I can't say I don't like any of the park. They're all great, but. I, it's just I this know. thing that we're. It's we're, funny. Yeah. I mean, I don't, Toronto, I don't think Toronto is a beautiful, because it's never been used. I don't know. Let's say like Montreal. I feel like they've, or other cities that are used. Uh, people enrich their lives through the architecture of the city and people who are designing the city somehow created something where everywhere you look let's say in Montreal is beautiful and where whereas the intentions of the buildings in Toronto have always been sort of utilitarian and 
But okay, so here's the thing, and you'd you'd have a really good perspective on this because you're from here and you spent what forty odd years here, right? Something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. So the thing about Montreal and cities that feel yeah, historical, I, I'm sorry, I hate to compare uh, no, Toronto I, well, and Montreal classic, again. Classic thing, uh, but yeah, they, it's, it's such what, an old. What will happen is those older, more beautiful uh, historical buildings won't be knocked down. Mm-hmm. They'll be maintained and maybe repurposed for something, so that mm-hmm. they're still in use. Does that happen in Toronto? I feel like there's a lot of like knocking stuff down that like the yeah. Toronto. What they do is they save the facade of the building or like one chunk. It's almost sarcastic like <laughs> when they do it. <laughs> there's like some new buildings on Queen Street, and they've saved literally just the bricks of the very front mm-hmm. of this once you know quaint kind of brick building. And then there's this glass and steel box that they've set bes- behind it. It's kind of cool. Like, I kind of like it because it's it's a reminder. It might not be beautiful or even thoughtful, but it's a lesson. It, everyone sees it, learns something about what's happening in this city. You understand the city when you see it. It's a visual reminder of just this big muscular steel thing that's pulsating behind all the... Sure. The, you know... But I, you, I just wonder if you, when you say as a painter, I can't think of anything I'd like to paint in Toronto. Yeah. Do you have a longing for a different Toronto aesthetic from your youth? No. Did it ever look good? No. It's always not. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay. This is a, so, it's sort of sad to say. I mean, it looked. I mean, my street looked good to me. Well, I my, mean, you have a nostalgic connection. Yeah, or the the way the garbage cans looked when I was young, or the fire hydrants, or you know, mm. or the way car wheels like hubcaps looked you know that is that nostalgia or is that do you think that's just something that you that's nostalgia it's nostalgia it's just oh okay. yeah it's like a and i don't i try not to romanticize it it's just i remember i can remember the way things look and the, um, the funny thing is like a lot of it kind of looks the same it's funny how do, were you have you ever been kind of aware that or that it seemed that in the past or before before even we were born every sort of five to ten years the the cities would look very different oh yeah the way people dressed yeah 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 the way the way cars look and then suddenly somewhere in the mid 90s and it might just be our, my perception I of how old same. i was yeah. everything looks the same i mean that now the skyline has changed in toronto but just if you look out this window now mm-hmm. i'm I mean, looking kind of kind of could be 1997 or like could be any time the way you were probably wearing that same shirt and it's not this exact same shirt but the same kind of shirt for sure yeah 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 so i don't know what's going well i think that uh i daniel romano once said something that i that stuck with me that um in terms of fashion and aesthetics uh time is now a flat circle like there used to be a time where in the 90s you would say to someone who was dressed like they looked like their parents did in the 60s that they they were out of time or maybe yeah. in high school, right? Like people would, there was the hippies and then there was the smokers right. and the metal guy and everyone sort of looked. And now like, I don't even pay attention. Like I just, I'm so immune yeah. to the, what people wear and there's no fashion really. No. Like I don't think like there's no, I mean, I know there's a whole fashion industry, but you can pretty much wear a shirt and pants from any era and no one will bat an eye anymore. I think, I don't know if it's a resignation, like people have just sort of given up on yeah trying to stay up on fashion or that it doesn't matter I, I it is confusing i i agree with you and i think maybe that's seeped into if you've got people doing that mm-hmm. well people design cities and i feel like that's what's going on maybe yeah is that we're all kind of in a there was a period where i mean you've seen tv shows from the future everyone does look the same <laughs> well it's it's not so much they all that dress everyone exactly looks the, the same yeah but i think it's because the major developments are all technological and they've all they're all, we're holding them in our Yes. Hands. That's where all the changes. All the happen. development and progress seems yeah. to be. You know, and then our clothes. I mean, it, we're we're not expressing ourselves through our clothes as much. Though, I mean, kids are. Oh, I mean, I work at a university, are. so I see what young people are wearing. Yeah. Like maybe I'm just not a, seeing what you. Well, but wearing. I also don't like. I notice it, and it's just from everything. It's just a little bit. It's like ripped jeans, which is from whatever. Yeah. It's ripped up. Like everyone's pants are all ripped up. Yeah, and everyone's, you know, and, and their shirts look like normal shirts, yeah. and I don't know what that's from anymore. There's a kind of night. I feel like the, and I don't want to get too far down here, but that ripped up look, yeah. which is I think of as coming from punk, grunge. There's a and and grunge eventually. There's a certain nihilism to what's going on in right. our view of the world, and we're 
you mentioned we're carrying these phones around with us, which basically have almost nothing but bad news on them. Yeah. Like, I mean, we take our photos, but that doesn't make any sense. Like, that's just like, this day and this yeah. life is so bleak, I'm going to take a photo of me smiling so I remember what that feeling is like. Yeah. And then the rest of the but, time, we're just trying to figure ourselves out in some ways, but yeah. also trying to ignore that we need to figure ourselves out. So I think people are just wearing whatever. Sorry, I didn't mean to go on. No, that's, that's cool. But I, it's funny also our relationship with... Uh, photography now absolutely everyone's taking a lot of pictures Mm -hmm. but does anyone ever look at their i mean this is maybe some people have spoken about this before but i don't i don't think anyone looks at their pictures anymore no i did a transfer of photos from my phone to my computer on friday or saturday night and then something didn't work and i panicked and Mm -hmm. called the provider of my fruit named company (laughs) that runs all my computer and my yeah phone and oh, and it turns out i found the eight photos i was just i was just trying to do a software upgrade on my phone and then yeah. i didn't want to lose the photos because that can happen sometimes yeah. and the phone the photos momentarily disappeared and i was on the tech support and then we figured out where they were and i was like i said that exact same thing to this person who i didn't know and like it is weird isn't it like i'm looking it's my folder here or whatever my app t- tells me i have fourteen thousand photos right on my computer <laughs> I'm never going to look at these photos. No. And yet, if anything, that's what people freak out about, is yeah. the memory that we've placed on the phone with the photos and yeah. the videos of our kids. Yeah. Like when my wife's computer crashes, she's like, oh my God, the photos, the photos yeah. of our children. Yeah. And when we were kids, I don't know if, about you, I had the, my parents had the physical photo album. Yeah. And, and those took, are all the pic- and there's that was it yeah there's 24 photos on a yeah there are no film. pictures of me at the age of seven let's say they just stopped well just I mean like if they were lost or something like that right. it's like there are pictures of me from my childhood but there you don't there aren't ten thousand pictures of me I don't know is, it's a it's a weird time it's a very individualistic time very yeah. self absorbed time but yet we don't look back sometimes it's funny I'm, when I'm I work at the art gallery yes. And I see people taking a lot of pictures, and I just can't imagine that they're ever going to look through their phone at the pictures of the pictures that they were looking at when they were experiencing them in the gallery. There's a general mistrust of, uh, I think there's a general mistrust of information across all societies. We don't, I mean, we, we live in, as you and I are speaking, we live in an age where certain leaders will talk about fake news, right. and I think that's permeated our entire consciousness. And we don't trust anything unless we document it ourselves. Oh, you mean they didn't they didn't see the work unless they They don't take a believe picture. no one will believe me. Right. No one will believe that I'm doing this right. thing or experience this thing unless I take a very low grade video or right. photo. That's a that's a ridiculous thing. And I don't <laughs> think that's necessarily a that's funny. city person thing or a country person thing. I have no idea. It's funny that you it's say It's a vacation person thing. It's a tourist. It's like a you're a tourist of your own life now. Yeah. You're just a you're a you're living your life and you barely, it's like you see yourself as a separate entity. We all are personas and avatars. We're not people. No. Sorry, this was not why I came to your house. <laughs> That's, a, well, I don't know. To vaguely depress and possibly enlighten everyone listening to us. I, I just, think it's good. I think that's true. We just, you're right. We act like tourists in our own lives. I better take yeah. a photo of this. Like, yeah. And you're right. Never going to look at them again. But I need to have them. Yeah. I need to know that my computer has stored them. If they, If not, I'm on the phone with tech support. Yeah. And there were eight photos that I'd uploaded. Anyway, my point here is, it's interesting to me that you're a city person. I am a city person. Because you are in the midst of a trilogy of music that seems more connected to, I don't know, the wilderness, so to speak. Right. Is that right? Is that... Well, okay. I'm trying to bring us... Yes yes and no. I mean, the most recent one? What's your most recent album called? Croak in the Weeds. Croak in the Weeds. Very naturalistic imagery right now. It is, and there is a lot of swampy kind of there's a lot of fr- amphibian Im- imagery frogs and yeah. i think there's a dog or two and there is there are dogs and frogs and swamps i or i was always imagining a swamp but it's not a l- actual swamp of course but what it's like a like metaphorical a, swamp a philosophical swamp a philo- well it's like all right this is what i was thinking it was like a misty sw- it was an image that i would keep in my head to help me stay in the mood of the record was mm-hmm. sort of a mist coming off of a swamp, like in the swamp thing. In the, in the, okay, all right. <laughs> or imagine that, but that kind of mist, like just like a movie of a swamp. But because a swamp or water has always sort of represented 
sort of uh, the subconscious. It's what you can't see. It's under is it deep yeah, there's under stuff the water. under the surface that you can't see. Yeah, right. And the frog swims on the surface, but also deep in underneath. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the the frog was sort of that, and then the mist is when the subconscious comes to you, visits you. Like you're, the water, you're in the swamp, even if you're not in the swamp. Yeah, you're breathing it, or you're in the clouds. Like so, you're in the water as you stand beside the water. Okay, if you're standing on the surface, or like if you're standing at the edge of the swamp or at the edge of the water, and the mist surrounds you, you're also in the water. And uh, as a, does that make any sense? It absolutely makes complete sense. It's very interesting. It's a very, uh, it's something to ponder as as human beings a little bit. I mean, in terms of the outer and inner layers of ourselves, is that right. maybe it's what just it's- laboring the <laughs> the metaphor of the of the subconscious as being the water, but breathing be, being in the subconscious as you're outside of the subconscious is what you're kind of trying to do. What I'm trying to do in music, or trying to do while performing music into the microphone into in in the studio you you feel like you might be conveying one thing but it stems from multiple layers of you yeah it's not simply it's conscious but it's there's something else yeah. driving it and allowing that to be the yeah what is driving me so what and con- making decisions based on allowing the subconscious to not trying to reason what what choices to make when making choices while recording with Sandra, like making a a recording to not use your conscious mind too much or to, to allow your, whatever you think you should do or mistakes that you've made to allow those mistakes to maybe inform choices made in the studio so that, so that it can maintain a sort of dreamlike quality and, and things that don't necessarily make sense but do make sense in the whole as a as a record. Okay. No, I mean that's that is that's a lot to think about. Do you have a sense of whether you, this notion for a record came to you consciously or subconsciously? That's I'm just curious if you're like, "Huh, I'm going to delve into the notion, the notional aspects of allowing your subconscious to kind of take yeah. over." No. So it wasn't written necessarily with those with that but it's just the way that i tried to keep myself in for the studio okay so for recording oh for recording and you mentioned sandra you were you worked with sandra perry yeah okay now i mentioned that you're in the middle of a trilogy yeah Uh, a proposed trilogy uh oh here we go again you've tried to do trilogies before yeah what happened they uh, they would always break down before being completed how far in have you got what's the usually most? two you make two, always two and then you bail and then something, or something happens. happens something happens when's the last Perfect. time you tried a trilogy i was i did some records for the label blue fog mm-hmm. and i made two but when i made the deal with blue fog the handshake deal mm-hmm. it was for three records right. i said i'll i want to make three records and then actually the third one of that series the blue fog series is in the can, as they say, it just hasn't been mixed, and there's a little bit more to do. Just only a little bit more. It's almost finished. Okay, so you still might do that. But it was abandoned almost eight or nine years ago. So I don't know if we'll, I'll ever finish it. Do you relate to that material still that's in the can? Kind of. I think it's good, hmm. and it doesn't matter anymore if I relate to it or not because like the vocal is done, like it's all finished. It just needs to be mixed. It might be. It might be fun to open it up again. What, what what constitutes a trilogy for you in in this regard? I mean the the trilogy that we were just speaking of, which is uh, which Croak in the Weeds is sort of part of, uh, seems to be interconnected thus far, although it's still in progress. Was there a theme to the Blue Fog trilogy that is still to be completed? A theme to that one. The themes are never narrative themes, like they're not. There's not a story that needs to be finished other than an autobiographical story. That's fine. Right, so... Sometimes it can be a sonic uh, connection as well. Yeah, it's a... Son- well, yeah. There's So the Blue Fog records were records that I made at a time when I was thinking that these 
which is this is the aesthetic for Blue Fog for me. Like I wouldn't have made those records the same way had they been on a, another label. That was that was my approach to the Blue Fog records. Was like I. That's how I was thinking at the time. I was thinking like these are Blue Fog records. That's just what I how, what what I would say to myself again while making the records. It's just to interject here. You, you're talking about a Blue Fog. And we were just talking about a mist. Oh, right. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So the, there's something going on with you and the blurry murkiness <laughs> yeah, I guess, of, I guess so. of texture. Maybe. Is that... But that, no, yes and no. I mean, it was, that's what he... That's what Blue Fog named itself. Right, right. Okay, so it's, a, it's just it a coincidence. It not come from me. It's a coincidence, but it's an interesting coincidence. Well, what, what, what is it about the notion of a trilogy that you find appealing? Why? Is it a numer- numerological thing? Three? What is it? I think it's maybe it started just as a joke uh, about having trilogy, like just the idea of records coming in trilogies or movies or the pretentiousness of like to set out to make it. So it always started maybe humorously, but then became a, a way again, ways to approach things like the ways to think about things, to think of a record as one of more than one of a series. It, it allows you to kind of take um, it gives you a little bit of space to feel like you're gonna you can continue some ideas on the next one and you don't need to complete uh, an idea on one record and so that kind of relaxes you and gives it gives you a bit more room I think I mean I if, if well, that makes any it sense, it does. I mean, it, uh, ideally, uh, records are connected by their creator because of their creator being the mm-hmm. principal uh, figure. I mean, but you're saying there's not necessarily lyrical themes, uh, but they will because once, yeah, there aren't necessarily lyrical themes, but you can reuse themes. It's a way of also keeping, just use recycling and keeping. Um, creative ideas available to you and not abandoning them so if i want to sing about frogs again on the third record or something from the first record i can use it and it'll still connect and i don't have to be thinking of a new idea in a sense i I can keep myself sort of swimming in the same ideas and and get more out of them than you would if you felt like you've already finished something and can't repeat it right but in a sense like if a if the creator of anything, whether it's books or films or records, uh, creates a series, whether it's a trilogy or not, and usually those things are marked by commonalities. It's a series because Luke Skywalker is in the first one and he's in the last one, right? Yeah. And there, there's commonalities there. Right. But at the same time, like the Rolling Stones, who are, what, 30, 40, 50 albums in, yeah. in a sense, that's all of the same expression. Yeah. It's connected yeah. By decades and years, so mm-hmm. that's why I'm just trying to get. When you say trilogy, yeah. I'm not trying to fixate on this. When you say trilogy, it seems like, for one thing, I would think you have them all done. the The records are done. I mean, maybe not recorded, but you have mapped out a thematic thing that needs to break up in three. Mm-hmm. That's what I think. But you're, yeah, but no. you haven't written a third album. No, it's not a trilogy. Let me put it to you this way, Andre. I don't know that this is a trilogy. It. Uh, did Sandra I, work on the first one? Yes. Okay. okay right. And Sandra worked on the second one. And if it is a part of the trilogy, then he will work on the third. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. I do. So yeah. in that way, it will be, yeah, a trilogy. Because it'll be my, uh, I will see it as a trilogy. And okay. I will s- contain my ideas th- or filter my ideas through that. And it will, because of that, be a trilogy. But okay. it doesn't. But it's also yeah. It's bullshit. It's not. It's nothing. It, but it's it's how I approach it, and I'm serious about it. It's not bullshit to me. No, it's a so it's, it's a focus for you. It's yeah, a way to it's focus a way it all. to focus, and it's right. a way to arrange uh, to organize my thoughts. It's sort it. of like creating a, a a calendar or a day timer with projects you have to complete, isn't it? You sort say, of. You say, uh, you know what? Uh, once I get through this uh, uh, painting, I have to do. I got to get to work on that back to work on the trilogy yeah that still needs to be completed yeah, it helps okay exactly it works that way on a very practical level and then on a more esoteric level it helps me know what i'm doing with the loosest parameters mm-hmm. like the loosest but enough of a parameter that i 
that it gives me something either to push against or to work within. I know that I'll do the next one with Sandro. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And I know that some themes will come back and some I'll reject and I'll push it. Because I'll also get tired of working within the same parameters. And so I'll have to push against them by the third. And I think that's interesting too when it gets laborious. So, or if I'm, yeah. there, for example, these records have used a lot of drum machine. Yeah, I And a I drum machine that. has, yeah. is in one way really freeing, and in another way it's really restrictive. And so there are times when I get tired of the drum machines and I want to resist the drum machines, or how can I? So now I'm thinking while working on this, working towards the next record, how can I make the drum machine, how can I change my relationship with the drum machine yet still use the drum machine because I feel like I started with it and it has to end with it. Mm -hmm. There's, so now that gives me something to think about when I'm out for a stroll or something like that. You know, I, I have to f solve some of those issues instead of just saying, well, I won't use a drum machine. So anyway, that's, that's helps. That explains it. Yeah. I mean, for those who haven't heard it yet, I mean, there is a drum, there's drum machine utilized, but it's, ostensibly a, a folk sort of idiom that you're in? Yeah, it's still sort of singer-songwriter. Whatever that means? Yeah. Yeah, okay. How did you come to work with Sandro? Because uh, Sandro, I think the last time he was on, we were talking about, um, speaking of trilogies, uh, He had. we were talking about his last album. Uh, oh, yeah. In, in Another Life, is it? Mm -hmm. Is that what it's called off the top of my head? I'm sorry, I've got a lot of... Something, going on. yeah. I think it's called. I think it's in, in another. In, <laughs> in any case, there is a trilogy on that record. Uh, Everybody's Paris, right? And uh, the the conceit is that Sandro does a has written a version of Everybody's Paris. Uh, Dan Behar of Destroyer has written a version of Everybody's Paris, and mm -hmm. that's kind of the hook. Everybody's Paris, and uh, Andre Etche has written a yeah. version of Everybody's Paris. Yeah. And so I know of your connection to Sandro uh, mostly from that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I assume it's Toronto. You might know each other. How do you... But you're working we together. We met years ago, maybe 15 years ago, through the CBC, actually. Not through the CBC, but I was asked at that time to do... A, they were inviting sort of songwriters to do something where we were all sharing the lyrics, like sending lyrics around or something, and they needed people. And I asked, I think then, if Sandro could do it, because I wanted to meet Sandro. I had only heard his music. He was recommended to me. Do you know the record store, the CD store, uh, Soundscapes? Of course. In Toronto? And they have records now. Do they have records? They have Good. vinyl records, yeah. Uh, well, there was an employee there named Matt Pollock. Do you know who that mm -hmm. is? Yeah. Or no, of them, yeah. He had introduced me to Sandro's music years and years ago as I was beginning, as I was moving away from the Deadly Snakes and Garage Rock, which was the band I used to be in. Yeah, we're going to talk about that, I and, hope, a little bit. Yeah. And then, uh, and was exploring kind of songwriters and songwriting. I mean, not that there wasn't songwriting in Garage Rock, but just, anyway. And he was like, I think you might like this guy. He's like the only person in Toronto that I know of that's kind of exploring the same sort of stuff as you and... Actually, I would kind of relate to Sandro in that way that I came from garage rock, which was such a genre that was became sort of restrictive. And he came from an electronic world, like electronic music and or experimental electronic music as yeah, used to work Pomo, under Pomo, 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 Pomo. Yeah. And then both of us around the same time were kind of rejecting our past a little bit and trying to figure out sort of songwriting as just sort of a as something very direct and simple. Anyway, and that's how we met. Did you pick up his album Tiny Mirrors? Is that yeah. One? Yeah. That's the it's first one I heard. Album. Yeah, it's an amazing record. Yeah. Or, no, actually, the first one I heard was a Pol oh, Pol 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 right. sings Sandra Pol 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 right. Anyway, but then <clears throat> it really, I really connected to Tiny Mirrors. Yeah. And then we became friends. And then after meeting through the CBC, and then we kind of started going out for coffee. His, For some reason, he was always down in the neighborhood where I had a painting studio mm -hmm. in... Uh, in Parkdale, and we would meet once a week and just have a coffee and have a conversation, much like this. And okay, then, so you're friends. Yeah. And then you started to work together. And we started, we did some soundtrack stuff together for some people that either worked out or didn't, and and then finally I just, we started working on the, this first record. Hmm. You mentioned the Deadly Snakes there, and I, I did want to ask you about your origin story a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you're a superhero, and I need to know your origin story on Sunday. I fell into a a vat of 
deadly snakes. <laughs> deadly snakes. So you're of in radioactive tr- snakes. And I, you're in Toronto. You're coming up in Toronto. How do you first get interested in music per se? Do you remember, like, as a fan, even uh, before yeah, uh, uh, you were a when player? I was in, I started getting liking music. Yeah, I guess in grade five and grade six, and, but in grade seven, very seriously. And I had uh, my friend Marco and my friend Josh and I started a band in probably grade eight, grade nine. And we were, uh, and then we played shows in Toronto, actually. We were kind of like a post-hardcore kind of Minutemen. We liked the Minutemen and the Pixies and Polvo and whatever was happening in the kind of 93, 92, 93, 94 kind of era. Did you ever see Flag Camp? Uh, did I? I don't think I ever, I must have seen Flag Camp. <laughs> I, we certainly listened to F- Flag Camp's record and Life Like Weeds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was really into Toronto's indie rock scene, like uh, Grasshopper. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mudfish, Goat Dance, all these bands were bands that I really were in. I was into, and my band was with Josh and Marco. Was called Eighth Rib, and we played actually not far from here, a block or two away from here, at Classic Studio at, okay. at College and. And uh, and Queen, we played our like our biggest show. We played this show with a band from Ottawa. Do you know the band Shotmaker? Of course, very well. Yeah, yeah that was our our crowning achievement. That's we, amazing. Yeah. Okay. So, what sparked your interest in grade five and six in the music? Do you remember? Like, was it? Well, grade five, grade six, my friends liked Brun DMC and the Beastie Boys at got, school. Yeah, yeah. At Guns and Roses, and and then for some reason, and then I went to a, an alternative school here in Toronto called Horizon Alternative oh, yeah. School for grade seven and grade eight, which is kind of in Kensington Market. Yeah. And there, I guess as it, as it is in most schools, everything was revolved like if the way, who the way you could communicate to your friends who you were was through music and what kind of music do you like. Yeah. And and I just I really fell in love with. Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin, of course. But Pink Floyd has been... I love Pink Floyd. Yeah. And actually, I think this new... My new record is... There's a lot of Pink Floyd on it, in my opinion. You might not be able to hear it. But to me, it's like very much the period of Pink Floyd between Sid Barrett and A Dark Side of the Moon. When yeah. They're, it, when they're kind of lost. Yeah. Actually, and trying to find themselves. Right. Like Adam Hart Mother. And there was... I was thinking a lot about those records when I was making this... What about the the impulse that to, to actually try to play yourself? You mentioned what it was about listening to music, but what actually made you think this was accessible to you as a player? To be able to play music? Yeah, I just am curious about. You that. know what? At Horizon, they taught us how to play guitar. If you weren't going to be in like uh, the orchestra, or like they would either teach you, you could either leave for a part of the day and and kind of learn a trumpet, which I didn't want to do, or then one of the teachers taught us how to play guitar and then, that's remarkable yeah and then we learned like smoke on the water and that kind of stuff so i could do it and i learned just enough to be a band to be in a band in grade eight that's what i learned yeah, right I, and that's all i have ever learned is just enough to write a song on a guitar and to be in a band but i've never progressed as a musician do you read so music and i more? can't read music i don't i I can't even really be all that helpful to anyone else if I was to join anyone else's band. I can only... Someone asks you what key a song's in, you can do that. Well, yeah, I can do that. But yeah. you can't... You no. wouldn't want to tell them what to do, per se. Yeah, I can't... Uh, I don't feel like I can't really aid anyone else's projects. Like, my knowledge is too limited. I can, I'm only good enough for myself. Right, right. Do you know? Right, sure. That's yeah. fair. So uh, you mentioned this band in grade eight, eighth rib. Is that eighth rib, we were called. Right. So when did the deadly? St- oh, you're mm. very well known for being in this band, the Deadly Snakes. Right. And so that band broke up in high school, and then right at the tail end of high school, I started a band with fr- my friends, some f- friends from Toronto, and started the Deadly Snakes. Just like when we were twenty nineteen. Mm-hmm. Just at, totally at the end of high school. Right at the end of high school, they were supposed to actually only be that summer. And then we were going to break up before I went to university, actually. Or that was what I thought. <laughs> like that, it was, and that's why the band was called The Deadly Snakes. I th- thought, in a sense, like that, that it sounded like a band that, you, that one used to be in. Uh huh. Like a memory. Like uh-huh. is it. Like that a, it was just a like a, you yeah, like a teenage gang. You had nicknames from the and 50s. Stuff. Yeah, lots of nicknames. What was your nickname? St. Clair was it so silly? Huh. 
because I, I was working on St. Clair at the okay. time. It didn't, it, but it made it sound very... I don't know, so, but you yeah. had like acolytes and followers and they all had oh, names, yeah. right? And it was like a little club. There was, it was very much a gang. Like, right. well, like a club. Right. And it was, but that's youth. Youth is all about building a, some kind of exclusivity around yourself to mm. protect yourself and in Toronto, I guess, anyway. And that's how we behaved. We were very exclusionary. Right. That's, you're, you're aware of this on some level. Like you, you, you were yeah, a I, I'm insular. A, yeah, we were super insular and we pushed, you know, we muscled our way in and our little gang took over little places and we just built a little, you know what I mean? That's when we were young and there were all the funny thing was like garage rock was dead at that time. That was, it was like an early nineties phenomenon or a mid nineties phenomenon. Like with the oblivions were breaking up, the gories had broken up, I think. Yeah. That whole world was sort of over. And so it was funny to all these people because the, the scene was older than us when we were 18, 16 to 19 year olds that would then go and, pl- you know, play shows and it would be like sort of people in their thirties were there and they thought we were funny as young people. And then suddenly that, that world got rejuvenated hmm. with the white stripes and hives, the hives, yeah. the white stripes, arguably the, the strokes. as Right. Well, of course. You know. Yeah, I saw the Deadly Snakes play a show uh, on the side stage of a giant event that was supposed to feature a Tribe Called Quest and Beastie Boys. But you guys were playing like, oh, yeah. first in the afternoon and on yeah. this giant... With R.L. Burnside. R.L. Burnside was amazing on that day. Yeah, he and, used he needed an amp. He used our, uh, Andrew's amp, our, our drummer's amp. Oh, wow. <laughs> our drummer had brought it. I was using his amp as well. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. So I saw you guys play there in the middle of the day. Yeah. But I think you were on pretty much first or something. Yeah, we played at... It was so hard for us to get there on time. It was in it was, Barrie? It was in Barrie and yeah. we were early 20s. Yeah. And for us to get up early enough to drive to Barry to play at noon or something like that was just, it was a real feat. At the time. Was that a thrill to be able to say you played with the Beastie Boys, so to speak? You mentioned that. I mean, Not really. You, you didn't really play with them, I guess. <laughs> I love the Beastie Boys. Yeah. But we didn't really play with them. We didn't stick around and watch the show. Oh. We just drove home. We were a jerk. Like, we were assholes. Like, we didn't <laughs> care about anything. You know what I mean? We, you did your own thing and you left. Yeah. Yeah. And then we left. Did you? But we met Ricky Powell. Oh, nice. Yep. Yeah. He was an asshole. Yeah, he's supposed to be. Yeah, he was a creep. But it would not to us. He was nice to us, but he just gave off that energy. Well, they sing about him being a bit of a creep. Yeah. Yeah, they do. I'm so, remembering the line. Yeah, now. yeah. I won't recite it here. And then I think the last time I th- believe I saw the Deadly Snakes, you were opening for the John Spencer Blues Explosion at the, uh, it used to be called the Cool House. Or the yeah. We warehouse. did some shows with the with John Spencer. John's a fan of yours. I don't know if he was a fan of ours, but he would let us play with him because he was good friends with... Um, you were on In the Red, right? We were on In the Red, and he was good friends with Larry, who runs that label. Yeah, and they put out some Blues Explosion stuff in the end. Yeah, and some Pussy Galore right, right, issues. Right. And he was... Yeah. And but he, John Spencer is a really cool guy. Great yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. Really nice so guy. would that have been around when the band was starting to slow down? Uh, I don't know the exact year of this. Uh, geez, I don't know. I can't did, remember. When did the Deadly Snakes start to slow down? We slowed say? down right after we made Porcella, that rec- our last record, which was in 2005. Maybe? Okay, that was a few years When after. was the first Polaris? We uh, were nominated for the first Polaris, and we had already broken up. Oh, okay. We I don't... broke up like the week before we were announced. Why did you break up? I it mean, was you're... just over. Oh. We were starting to fight. The tours, well, I mean, we were always fighting. We always fought, but it was starting to get, we were too old to fight the way that we were fighting. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because all of our relationships had been created when we were teenagers and now we were kind of getting into our late twenties. I think that a lot of the guys in the band also realized if they were ever going to make lives for themselves outside of music, that you kind of have to do it. We had to do it now, you know? Yeah. Are you still in touch with yeah. everybody? I was left. I was with Max max just the other day we were at a friend's uh, art opening and we were talking about the snakes and how the snakes will never get back together and how in fact we get back together all the time like you won't get together to play no we would never play a concert or a show do you ever jam no we don't really jam all that much really but but max and i were together there and we had gotten back together we were mm. sitting next to each other yeah that's a bond that will last forever <laughs> yeah. on some level but um 
do any of the other... That's the success of that band. I see that band as a success because we quit when we wanted to and we be, and maintain... Like that we started as friends prior to the band and we're still friends now. So in a sense, my sense of the Deadly Snakes starts prior to the band starting and it continues now. That's when I see Max, I think of him as Max from the Deadly Snakes. Like we're... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's our, our gang. It's just that we're not... We just don't play music. Did you ever break up and come back? Did the band ever slow down and then... I, I just, I thought the, snake, the snakes broke up and, and then, well, we kind of, we played our last show at the horseshoe and then immediately got back together and played the show, a show the next night at the silver dollar. Yeah. For, for okay. free. Well, like, maybe that's what I'm thinking of. So we played our official last show and it was the last show. And then we got back together and, and played a show immediately. And then we also played a show in Portland, in Portland, like a year later for a garage fest that we just did because they were paying really well. And I think. We thought it was going to be fun, and it was fun, but it wasn't fun to play. It was fun to go to Portland and see all of our friends' bands, and we just did it. So it's it's you're saying it's never getting back together. It's behind you. Have the other Deadly Snakes gone on to make music the way you have? Not the way, not like the way some you have. have. Yeah, Andrew is the only Andrew and Chad Ross. Andrew Mazinski and Chad Ross are in a band, Comet Control, mm-hmm. and they were in, they. They both. Are they both in Quest for Fire? They, yeah, but that right. band is defunct. Right. Okay. And then, so Max doesn't make music. He's a filmmaker. Matt Carlson is a carpenter. He's a great musician, but I don't think he's doing anything hmm. like that. Okay. So something in you, and your role in the Deadly Snakes was what? How would you describe your role? Were you the singer, songwriter, musician? I wrote a, we all wrote songs, but I was, I sang the most though Max sang a lot too. It was all shared. It was right. like a real shared band. But I played guitar okay. and sang most of the songs. So it made sense for you to do something different. Um, but your trajectory as a as yourself, um, would you say it immediately moved away from the Deadly Snakes aesthetic? Like The Deadly Snakes themselves were trying to move away from themselves within the band. Like um, upon be, becoming a band, we were immediately resisting what we thought we were at first. Right. If that makes any sense yeah. to you, so everything has been moving in a trajectory out from that first record, maybe. Uh, this this seems to ha- me this happens well. to bands. I don't know if it's a Canadian ph- phenomenon. I mentioned Daniel Romano earlier, and I think of his band Attack and Black. Same thing. They started as one thing, and then towards the end, you could see it was becoming something totally different. Yeah. And then it stopped. And then when the individuals that primarily wrote the songs went off you could see where they could have maybe they thought they were going to go yeah almost everyone uh who was in this young punk band went on to be like a singer songwriter type person it's like they aged out of being in a young punk band yeah do you feel that way it makes sense well it makes sense that bands will would reject their initial concept because maybe you unify you have to conceptualize to unify yourself at first you don't just say let's just start a band there's people say let's start a band and we're going to be this and then they and they define themselves to each other so that they can have common ground and be a band yeah then you become a band and you realize that you can be or your real personality as musicians start coming out and you have to abandon that initial concept yeah because you because, change. Because you change and you yeah. grow and you learn, you become what you actually are. Not Because the initial concept is often just mimicry of another band, right? Because that's how you can say, like, we should be a band like this or, yeah. or that or the, some really rigid definition of a genre. And then, you break, and then you push against it as you grow. Well, you seem to have maintained something of the attitude of a young uh, kind of rebel or whatever. I remember you had a song called Cop Killer. That yeah. we used to play when I worked at CBC, and it was a bit it was a bit jarring to hear this. Like, as I recall, the arrangement wasn't particularly uh, boisterous, but the delivery no. of the lyric and and it's not about people killing cops. That song was about a a police horse that accidentally killed a cop. Well, it just echoed the body count song in a really interesting yeah. way as well. That's all. I started with the title. <laughs> yeah, it did, and yeah. then I, I wanted to write a song with that title. Right. Stolen from 
body count. Right. And then as I wrote the song, it be, that's the story that came out of it. I guess I, this is kind of a weird question, but do you still feel like your music is unsettling? Does it feel dangerous on some level? Like I think of your music as still being really enigmatic, but there's also a real loveliness to it. In fact, more than anyone, your new record was in in, par, in various points reminds me of Al Tuck, who's a, an artist I really admire. I love Al Tuck. And your voice, occasionally I'm like, oh, wow. He, you, I don't know. I didn't know if you... It's, it's heartening to hear that you like him. Yeah. But... Um, He's got a very soulful way of singing, and it's, it's there's an earnestness there. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I, well, I, I'm not earnest. You're not earnest. No, I don't think so. I'm earnest goes to camp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a an underlying humor to what you're doing. I think it's yeah, it's funny, or I tell myself it is. I think that's how I've become. It's I think people hear it as earnest because I've told myself that I'm joking. Well, I mean, you're singing about dogs and love and and sort of sort of funny imagery. Yeah, and then when I'd sing about men aging and the sort of sadness of life, and I've, I'm always telling myself that I'm not that I'm writing in character, right? And it's a comedic, or it's I can be cruel to that character, <laughs> and then it's only year, like later that when upon reflection that I can see that it's maybe some what to do with myself at all you know? the mist the subconsciousness and the yeah. mist is starting to permeate yeah so that's what happens so but it's all done i can be i, I write about a char- character and i can be cruel to that character a, a character or i can be smarter than that character the listener can be smarter than the character yeah and then it's only later that i realize it's me and it's only later that the listener maybe un- realizes it's them <laughs> as well it's a it's like a it's like a conversation yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot. We have conversations uh, ostensibly to learn about each other, but you always end up learning about yourself. Uh, yeah, if, if you pay attention. Well, they say as a painter that they're, a painter only can paint self portraits. Like that's the that's every painting is doing. a self portrait. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, that's how I, I'm starting to feel about what I do here. Yeah. It's like, uh, am I really? I mean, you worry about the selfishness aspect of it. Like, am I really trying to learn about someone else or am I trying to take their experience and explain myself to myself? Yeah. And I feel like that's going on a little bit on your record. This this sense of self, this objective self, it's what we were talking about earlier. Maybe we are a little bit, it's impossible not to be something of a tourist in your own body uh, right. about visiting yourself. Yeah. <laughs> or we know it instinctually and they, we, we know it instinctually that yeah. we are tourists in this world. Yes. And now we've learned the behavior of tourists as well. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah, we yeah. have cameras with us all the time. So I, I, I want to ask you what's next. Uh, uh, and I know that there's a trilogy that yeah. we've been discussing. So yeah. how close are you to beginning the third? the third record? I don't know. I'm beginning to write the songs now. Okay. Just in the past couple of days, I think. And do you reference the first two? What's the first album called, by the way? Under Grape Leaves. Under grape leaves, and you've got croak in the weeds. It's yeah. all the vegetation. So well, now I'm stuck. I'm like I'm not stuck, but I have to think of a title. And it has to that necessary. should it relate to that because it's beginning because it's be, they begin they they sound like they're related. Then how do you you know what I mean? Well, not, the titles don't come. I, you, you well, like, they're both. There's foliage. Yeah. Under grape leaves, croak in the weeds. Yes, there's almost half rhyme. There's a half rhyme going on, yeah. almost. Yeah, yeah, you got. You're I don't stuck. Know what to, you are stuck. I am stuck. You got to come up I with something. So you don't. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have. And, and, and on some level, this whether this third record calls back to the first two it remains to be seen. Mm-hmm. You don't know what's going to happen. Except I know that it will. It will relate, if only, by virtue of. Sandra's name also being on it. You'll definitely work with Sandra again. I'm pretty sure, and the album covers will relate to each other. They'll look like a trilogy, okay. and that may be enough. And then everyone else does the rest anyway. They connect things. Like you were talking about Luke Skywalker being in all those movies. <laughs> all those. <laughs> I mean, it's only our in our imagination that that those movies even connect because it's not real life. It's not as it's not a story. It's not a history. It's we. It's just a little slice of things that people have written to kind of as a gesture that there's somehow a story that connects them all in a sense. Well, we're also reacting to how the story is we are the We glue them together. We connect it as if it was real. It's just pictures. But 
but again, the creator has framed it as saying, not to be too heavy handed, but these things are connected by these characters and this story arc. As I am as well. You are doing as well. Okay. Um, Where can people go to learn more about you online? I guess the website for Telephone Explosion. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) That's the best bet? I guess so. To learn about me or, yeah, you could see my paintings at, you're not very online. No. Is that on purpose? I'm just not good at it. You're not good at being online? It's a bit distracting. Yeah. I don't know what I would do. Or like, uh, what would I do? Have a website? Well, um, I mean, you've got records. There so are could... videos on YouTube that right. you can watch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not trying to... I'm not <laughs> no, trying no, to no, I'm just wondering, but like, who... Give me an example of a song, like a musician that is good, is is online. Oh, uh, you mean, I don't even mean like overly actively. Well, like, I don't know. There are people who really glom onto it and. Oh, uh, yeah. Are good at social media. And they do the Twitter and stuff. I just mean having a yeah. website with your records for sale is. Yeah. I have an Instagram account. Okay. Is it just your name? It's my name with David Angus. It's Andre Dal, at D A L, being my middle name. Okay. So but, people can follow you on yeah. that if they want to. Okay. Is there a song from the latest album that we can go out on? Would you pick one for us? Why don't... There's a one that... There's a video that got made by my friend Eva. And it's a beautiful video, but it was for uh, Dream On Pigs. Pigs. Would you play that song? I can play that if you like. Is there anything you want to say about it before we hear it? Besides the video part? No, not really. I think it's it's funny. There's like lots of little jokes in it. Is this after the the cop has been killed in the cop killer song, and then now they have to just? There's a lot of yeah. I've, I'm kind of antagon. I like <laughs> <laughs> antagonistic towards the, the cops, but I just like the the culture of antagonism towards cops, or like the are the, the, pigs, the, are the pigs I are like the slogans, of anti-cop sure, slogans, right? And the aesthetic of them, I guess they more, are more than I'm anti-cop. I think there are lots of great cops, and we need them. So, but are the pigs in this? They have nothing to do with the police. Oh, they do. Okay. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> the, the pigs. pigs. It's that's the pig true. dream on, like, it's about freedom and escape. And it's like, in my mind, that statement is, I see, like, someone driving away and escaping, the pig, crossing the border or whatever it is ah. where the pigs will never catch them. Oh, I see. Freedom. Oh, dream on pigs. It's addressing the pigs. Like, yeah. Good luck. Okay. All good right. luck catching. But then it can also be... Uh, I shouldn't have nailed it down because that's I like your interpretation too that you'd like for the cops to to continue dreaming right and, okay yeah. all right well let's hear it maybe well, obviously we've set it yeah. up in a way and and people can hear it this is a dream on pigs by Andre Etche uh, Andre thank you so much it's thank so you, nice Vish. to catch up with you again it's really and, nice to have you here yeah best of luck with everything going forward thanks. Walk with me, son of man, down to the valley so low. Frog prince and the prince of peace. Peace frog on the radio. Get on that bus and ride 
the snake dream on Very special thanks to Andre Etche for appearing on this, the 503rd episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms and Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom, everything else as well. If you can't find an episode that you're looking for on any of those platforms, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter, go to my website, vishkana.com. You can like Creative Control on Facebook if you haven't already. And as long as Facebook still exists, I feel like it's going down. I'm almost done. I'm almost completely done. I'm only on there to deal with the show. Ah, it's... Anyway, you should go on... Log... Register for a Facebook account now, just so you can <laughs> like my show. Please. What's what's the harm? What's going to happen? Also, follow the show on Twitter, at Vish Creative, or follow me directly, at Vish Khanna. You can listen to a radio show version of Creative Control on Wednesdays at noon, Eastern Standard Time around the world at cfru.ca or on an actual radio at 93.3 fm if you're in or near guelph also visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation and keep this podcast going just a reminder there's a new six dollar tier six dollars and above a month gets you exclusive content that i'm posting on the patreon page so if you're interested in that patreon.com slash creative control Thanks again to Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts for their in-kind support for this show. As always, thank you, Jim Guthrie, for your support of this show. Please visit jimguthrie.org to learn more about Jim and his amazing music. And last but not least, thank you very much for listening to this episode with Andre Etche. I hope uh, if you're new to the show that you check out some other episodes and uh, subscribe to the podcast and tell your friends to do the same. That's all I can really say at this point. And that's all I'm going to say because I have to go. I will talk to you soon. Goodbye for now. <laughs>